All right, Deuteronomy chapter 19. Deuteronomy chapter 19. Uh, Deuteronomy 19 is kind of a repeat in some ways. There's a lot of same material that's getting covered that was in Deuteronomy 17, but not a lot of it, but there is uh, some, definitely some principles that are repeated. And as I've said many times going through uh, this book so far, and elsewhere even in Scripture, you know, when, when God is reiterating things, you know, that's when we need, those are the things we got to pay attention to. And especially, you know, this would apply more to society in general. This would be something that, you know, those civil authorities that have uh, the power to execute judgment on, upon a society, they are the ones really that should be paying attention to some of the things that we've read about so far and are going to touch on again tonight. But it says there in verse 1, it says, When the Lord thy God hath cut off the nations whose land the Lord thy God giveth thee, and thou succeedest them, and dwellest in their cities and their houses, you know, it's good to just take notice again. We've preached about this in the past, about the fact that, when the children of Israel moved into, in, into that land, you know, they moved right into houses that were prepared for them. They moved right into vineyards and olive yards that they didn't have to plant. God had everything just ready made for them. That's how much he blessed these peoples. And he's saying, you know, when you go in there, and he's kind of reminding them, when thou succeedest them and dwellest in their cities and in their houses, he says, then shalt thou separate uh, three cities for thee in the midst of thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess, and thou shalt prepare thee away and divide the coasts of thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee to inherit, into three parts that every slayer may flee thither. Now, when we read that word slayer today, that kind of has a, you know, a very negative connotation, and it is a negative thing, but we kind of mis might misunderstand that as somebody who has intentionally killed somebody. And if we read this context here, you know, a slayer is not somebody who has gone and intentionally slain someone. That's not the type of person he's referring to. You know, God here is, is, per, is uh, providing a means for that, such a person to flee. You know, we've seen often that God, you know, prescribes the death penalty, and we'll look at that here again in a minute. But uh, what's going on here in this passage is, again, as we've seen repeatedly so far in the book of, book of Deuteronomy, is that God is careful that innocent blood is not shed. This is something that is very important to God, even going all the way back to Cain and Abel. When, when Cain rose up and slew his brother Abel because his works were evil and, Cain, and, and Abel's were, uh, because uh, Abel's were good and Cain's were evil, you know, he, God came to him and said, thy, thy, this, thy, bro, uh, thy, sons, or thy, sons, thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. I mean, God takes note of innocent blood. He hears it, it cries unto him from the ground, and God is a God of justice. God wants that to, he wants that to be made right. So, but he's also very careful to make sure he's even provided uh, means by which innocent blood would not be shed uh, I, accidentally. You know, a man might think this is a proper time to, you know, kill somebody when they've accidentally killed another person that, you know, life must go for life. But uh, the Lord is very careful here, and he's saying, look, this guy is not at fault, you know, and he's providing a way for him to escape. And we have to understand something <laughs> is that, you know, the death penalty is something that predates the law. You know, we've talked about it a little bit the last couple times we've been in Deuteronomy. But this, is something, this isn't something that, that is new. It, it goes before the law. If you remember in Genesis 9, when they first came off the ark, and if you would, go to Genesis chapter 6 very quickly. In Genesis chapter 9, uh, God said, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. So God had already prescribed the death penalty before Moses had received the law from him on Mount Sinai. He had already prescribed that man should be shed, uh, killed by man, should he, you know, shed man's blood. And, you know, people today, they squirm at that, they scoff at that, they call that inhumane, they call that barbaric, they say that's, you know, some Stone Age thing, that's this Bronze Age book that you're reading. But, I mean, look at society, how is it really working out for us? The more and more we've gotten rid of the death penalty, the more that we, we, we've stopped, uh, you know, executing those that are worthy of death, has it made society better? Have we, have, we call, have we morally and culturally improved as a nation? No. Uh, wickedness has abounded even more and more. And you know, I've preached other sermons about that, how that because ec uh, uh, judgment against an evil work is not swiftly executed, uh, it is fully set in the hearts of men to do evil. When, when men who are wicked see that there is no punishment for their sins, they're just emboldened. You know, the, the death penalty is a deterrent, and it's also a protective measure to keep innocent people from suffering at the hands of wicked individuals. In fact, notice here the consequence when God didn't prescribe the death penalty because there was a time prior to the flood that there was no death penalty. God had not given that out. And if you look here in Genesis chapter 6, we, we see how that, ma that worked out for man, that how it ended up. It says in verse 10, And Noah begat three sons, 
Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And it's not talking, you know, it's talking about men doing uh, evil things to one another. They're violating one another. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So I guess you could kind of say in, the, in, in a way that God still did, you know, enact the death penalty here because he wiped everybody out. But, you know, the, this, this law of man shedding man's blood, uh, you know, in, in, in recompense for murder, you know, had not yet been doled out. And what was the result? Is that the earth became filled with violence. You know, this is a measure that God has given mankind to curb the, the wickedness of men. So it's a very important thing, but it's also something that's supposed to, as we talked about again in previous chapters, that it, God handles delicately. That it can be a double-edged sword. You know, if we're not careful to make diligent inquiry, and if we don't follow these safeguards that God has prescribed, it could be that innocent people are killed. And that would defeat the whole purpose. That, that uh, innocent blood is being shed. So, one measure that we see here is that God is protecting innocent blood from being shed by distinguishing manslaughter, what we would call manslaughter day, from, from murder. And he's providing its own consequences. And we even have something like that in our, in our law today. We know we have first, second, and third degree murder. We you know premeditated murder versus manslaughter. These are different charges that come with different consequences. So if you look there in verse 4, it said, and this is the case of the slayer, <coughs> you know, somebody who's killed someone, which shall uh, flee hither, thither, excuse me, that he may live. Whoso killeth his neighbor ignorantly. Okay, so this is not premeditated. This is something that he didn't mean to do. You know, uh, he, he, it was as an accident. Whom he hated not in times past. So often that's what goes along with premeditated murder. You know, the people will examine their motive. You know, what happened here? Well, you know, they hated this individual. Did they have a history? You know, when they investigate these things, you know, that's sometimes that's something that comes out and they can make their uh, judgment. So, but this is the case of a guy, you know, we make diligent inquiry. We find out, hey, he was ignorant of it. It was an accident. He didn't hate him in times past. You know, he was friends. He had no motive to kill this guy. In verse 5, it says, as when, he gives this example, right? Now, it's not, you know, it's not limited to just this example, you know. He's just using this as an example of, hey, when this kind of thing happens. As when a man goeth into wood with his neighbor to hew wood, and his hand fetcheth a stroke with the axe to cut down the tree, and the head slippeth from the hell, and lighteth upon his neighbor that he die, he shall flee hither into one of those cities. And that kind of thing happens. I remember I had a job where we would swing, uh, you know, five-pound sledgehammers. And you're always told, do not stand anywhere near where that, that thing might come off. You're, not, you're supposed to stand on the opposite side. If somebody was swinging over here, you should be on that side of them for fear that head might come off and you, know, you might you know, get a, a little bit more than a goose egg from that. But he's saying that's the type of instance that we're talking about, right? If somebody's just going about their work, they're just out working in the field, you know, and we've, you know, we, we uh, see this kind of thing happen all the time. Accidents happen all the time. People get hurt, people even get killed, you know, and we take measures to prevent it, but accidents happen. And that's what this God is talking about here. Somebody who has no animosity toward this individual, they did it ignorantly, it was just an accident, right? It, the, the, the head slippeth from the hell and lighteth upon his neighbor that he die. As he says of that guy, he shall flee into one of these cities and live. He's saying, look, you're not going to kill this guy. You know, you're going to separate these three cities under the Lord and and you're going to let him flee into that. And that's where he's going to, say, to stay. In verse 6, Lest the avenger of blood pursueth the slayer while his heart is hot and overtake him because the way is long and slay him whereas he was not worthy of death. So remember, God is saying, look, you're going to set apart three cities. He said, and thou shalt make a way, right? So they weren't just to have three cities, but they were actually to have, these cities were to be connected and part of the, 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 the highways and byways so that a person who was in this circumstance could quickly get on this road and get to one of these cities. You know, unless the way be long, right, it's hard to get there, and the guy, the, 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 the avenger of blood caught, catches up to him. Now, who's the avenger of blood? Well, this obviously would be somebody who knew the guy that was killed. You know, somebody who's upset about the fact, you know, or maybe doesn't understand the circumstances, you know, is not going to sit around and wait for a trial or to hear it and let delegate, you know, let inquisition be made. Somebody who just looks at the circumstances, hey, that was my brother, 
you know, that was my dad, that was my son, whatever, some kind of relation, a friend or whatever, and just, just is out to, for vengeance. You know, their heart is hot. You know, and that's kind of a crime of passion type of thing. Somebody gets, you know, just, they're, you know, they're just caught up in the emotion of the moment and they just want to exact vengeance on, the, on this guy. Maybe because they don't understand the circumstances. I mean, when two guys go out into the wood with an ax and only one comes back, you know, can you really blame somebody for having questions about what's taking place, right? But he's saying, look, if this is what happened, make sure this guy can get quickly to where he needs to go, to one of these three cities, and it turns into six later. <laughs> he says, lest the avenger of the blood pursue the slayer while his heart is hot and overtake him because the way is long and slay him, whereas he was not worthy of death, inasmuch as he hated him not in times past. Wherefore, I command thee, thou shalt separate three cities for thee, and if, and I want us to pay attention to that word if, and if the Lord thy God enlarge thy coast, as he hath sworn unto thy fathers, and give thee all the land which he hath promised to the uh, given to thy fathers, if thou shalt keep all the commands and to do them, which I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God and to walk ever in his ways, then shalt thou add three cities more for thee besides these three. So God is saying initially, you're going to have three cities. And then he says, and you're, go and you're going to add three more. But there's a stipulation there. How are they going to get three more cities? Well, the only reason there would need to be three more cities is, is if God enlarged their coasts. You know, if God gave them more land, if they were able to take over more land that they, God had sworn unto their fathers. So the if there is, if they will obey God, so we can kind of see the fulfillment of this promise that if they obey God, if they love him, if they walk, if they keep all these commandments and do them, and they walk ever in his ways, that God is going to expand the land that they have. They're going to have, and then they'll have need for three more cities. But it's again important to notice that, you know, that's an if there. There was no promise that, you know, God was going to give them all of this land. He gave them this bit first and said, okay, here's this first portion. Put three cities up. If you obey me and keep my commandments, you'll have need of three more because I'll enlarge your borders. I'll expand your coasts. So, you know, that's kind of just a principle that we can apply to ourselves today is that, you know, what, 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 if we want God to enlarge us spiritually, you know, as individuals, as a church, even as families, numerically, spiritually, whatever it is, you know, we have to make sure that we're being faithful with, with what God has given us to begin with. You know, unto, you know, unto whom so much, much, is, much is given, of him shall much be required. You know, God holds us accountable for what we have. And, and if we do well with it, you know, unto him shall more be given, right? Uh, and, and that way we can expand. So that's kind of a principle that we see there is that if we want more from God, if we want to enlarge, we got to make sure that we're walking ever in his ways, that we love him, that we keep his commandments, that we obey those things that he has commanded us to do. So that was kind of an interesting thing I thought there that, you know, there was no prompt. They, they didn't have need of six. They only needed three. And if they kept God's commandments, then they would later need six. But these cities, again, they were there verse 10 that innocent blood be not shed in thy land which the lord thy god giveth thee for inheritance and so blood be upon thee you know god god holds the nation accountable for this innocent blood not just the individual who's 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 shed it you know god looks down and says you know he's going to avenge the, that blood upon the earth <clears throat> he doesn't want and we don't want that blood upon us you know he doesn't want this to to be applied to them now, if you would, go over to uh, Numbers chapter 35. Numbers ch chapter 35, we'll look at some scripture where it talks about what these cities are. These cities that, uh, that have been set apart, these three cities, are what the Bible refers to in Numbers as cities of refuge. I mean, that's what it was to that guy, you know, who's running for his life. You know, he's looking for a city of refuge, somewhere where he can find a safe harbor, somewhere where he can find safety and protection, to where we know he's, he's not going to have to look over his shoulder and wonder if somebody's going to come get him. Look there in verse 10 in Numbers 35. It says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you become over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall appoint you cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the slayer may flee thither, which killeth any person at unawares. Again, this is somebody who's done it ignorantly and, and didn't, you know, did not hate him in times past. And they shall be unto you cities for refuge from the avenger that the manslayer die not until he stand before the congregation in judgment. Right? So the, what God is providing here is that he would, he's providing the, this person's right to a trial, to have his, his case heard in a day of court, to say, hey, this was an accident. I didn't do this. And then, you know, witnesses could be brought. 
and say, did you ever notice any conflict? Has he ever badmouthed this guy? Did he ever say anything along the lines of, you know, I hate him? You know, there could be diligent er inquiry could be made. Now, it might be that this guy goes to the refuge, you know, and it was murder. You know, and he's, he's just trying to say, well, you know, hey, it was an accident. And then, the, you know, then the, the witnesses come and they find out, well, that's not, in fact, the case. In fact, it's, it, it looks like you did intentionally kill this individual, and then they would go from there. But God here, again, is just being very careful to preserve innocent life. Even a guy who has accidentally killed somebody. He's saying, let's not let it get out of hand here. <clears throat> and they shall be unto you cities for refuge. Uh, uh, verse 13. And of the of these cities ye sh which ye shall have, give six cities that ye shall have for refuge. Ye shall have, give three cities on this side, Jordan. Three cities shall ye give in the land of Canaan, the, uh, which shall be cities of refuge. These six cities shall be a refuge both for the children of Israel and for the stranger and for the sojourner among them, that everyone that killeth any person unawares may flee thither. Again, so this goes back to the fact that God says there shall be one law for all people in the land. You know, they, they didn't have to necessarily be a citizen of Israel. You know, if this happened within their coasts, you know, even if it was a stranger, that's what it's talking about there, is somebody who's a foreigner in their land, that they had the same right to this trial. You know, and they didn't, you know, and this is, you know, the, 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 the law of the land. You know, this is what that person could appeal to, the, 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 whole, the book, you know, the, the law. They could say, well, you know, your God told you to give me a trial. You know, they had some way, something to appeal to. So God's saying, look, there's going to be one law for these people, not a multitude of different laws and, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and it says there in uh, verse 16, And if he smite him with an instrument of iron so that he die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be uh, surely put to death. So he's saying, look, if it turns out this guy did kill him intentionally, you know, then he's a murderer. He shall be put to death. God prescribes the death penalty for murderers. You know, and, that, and that's something that our country has backed away from. You know, and, and I think the big, probably the main reason for that is because a lot of greedy individuals discovered that there's a lot of money to be made in the prison industrial complex. You know, the vast majority of people in prison should either be set free, because well, you know, or they should, you know, according to God's law, they would be beaten, pay a fine, or or put to death. You know, you don't see imprisonment in the Bible. God does not prescribe that. Yeah, that is the cruel and unusual punishment to lock somebody up in a cage. And so he goes on. And he says there, uh, if in, in verse seventeen, and if he smite him with a throwing stone where, wherewith he may die, and he die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. Or if he smite him with a hand weapon of wood, wherewith he may die, that he die, he is a murderer. He's saying it doesn't matter how he does it. If the guy murdered somebody, he's a murderer. He shall be put to death. The revenger of blood shall slay their murderer, wherewith when he meeteth him, he shall slay him. But if he thrust him of hatred, or hurl at him by lying of weight, that he die, or in the enmity with him uh, with his hand, that he die, he shall uh, that smote him shall surely be put to death. For he is a murderer, the revenger of blood shall slay the murderer which meeteth, which, uh, when he meeteth him. But if he thrust him suddenly without enmity, or cast up upon him anything uh, without, without lying of weight, or with any stone wherewith uh, a man may die, seeing him not, and cast it upon him that he die, and was not his enemy, neither sought his harm, the congregation shall judge between the slayer and the revenger of blood according to these judgments. And the congregation shall deliver the slayer out of the hand of the avenger of blood. So he's saying, look, if this wasn't premeditated, if it was an accident, if he was ignorant of it, he's not going to be put to death. But the guy that has purposed in his heart, you know, has said, I am going to kill this individual, and then goes about and does it, that makes him a murderer. The, the guy who, you know, manslaughter, you know, even the crime of passion, these things are not to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, punished with death, excuse me. And it says in verse 25, And the congregation shall deliver the slayer out of the hand of the revenger of blood, and the congregation shall restore him to the city of his refuge, wherewith he was fled. Now, it's not that this guy just gets off scot-free. You know, when God says, hey, he's going to live in that, basically he says here, we're going to read it right here in a second. In fact, let's read it right now. He says, And he shall bide in it unto the death of the high priest, which was anointed with the holy oil. So the guy doesn't just get off scot-free. The guy who just accidentally kills somebody, you know, he has to go and live in the city of refuge until the high priest die. So, I mean, if you're that guy, you know, one, you know, the, a week ago, the, high, the new high priest just got put in office, you know, this young guy with a long life ahead of him, and the next week you accidentally killed somebody, you got a, you got a long road to hoe. You know, you're going to be living in that city for a long time. 
But that's just how God works things out. You know, God is balancing everything out. That was a form of punishment, if you think about it. I mean, if I were to come to tell you and say, you know, hey, you got to go, you have to leave Tucson and you have to go live in a city like, what's an undesirable city to live here in Arizona? Anybody want to pick on a city in Arizona tonight? No one? Yuma. Yuma. Phew, man, never been there. Is it that bad? Hey, you got to go live in Yuma, Fabian, for the next, you know, until, until uh, you know, Pastor Anderson keels over from old age, you know, and, you know, he takes good care of himself, so it could be a while. You know, you, you might be there for 30, 40, maybe plus years, and, you know, but that's it. You know, you got you to gotta stay there. You got to stay in Yuma. That would be a form of punishment, wouldn't it? Would it be as bad to be put to death? No, I mean, you could still have a life, but, you know, you're not allowed to leave Yuma. You got to stay there, and, you, you know, that's where you're going to live for the rest of your life. You got to work there. If you're going to have a family, you have to raise it. Your, you know, a family could come visit you, but you cannot leave this city. That's where you have to live the rest of your days. So there was a form of punishment. You know, the guilty, they were isolated from, you know, the familiarity. They were isolated from friends. They were isolated from family, you know, their, their familiar surroundings. And what's going on there is that they're kind of suffering to, to some degree, the same thing that the family of the victim is suffering. You know, the, 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 the victim's family, they're suffering the loss of, of, of a familiar friend. They're suffering the loss of somebody that they can't just go see whenever they want. So God's kind of balancing the scales here, if you can see that. You know, God's working that out. So there is a punishment involved. Go ahead and go back to Deuteronomy chapter 19. Deuteronomy chapter 19. <coughs> and it goes on and says, but if, in verse 26, But if the slayer shall at any time come without the border of his refuge, whether he was fled... I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm still in Numbers. Go back to Numbers if you want, or you can follow along. Numbers chapter 35, he says, But if the slayer shall at any time come without the border of the city of his refuge, uh, uh, whither he was fled, and the avenger of blood find him without the borders of the city of his refuge, and the revenger of blood killeth the slayer, he shall not be guilty of blood, because he should have remained in the city of his refuge until the death of the high priest. So he's saying, look, if Fabian comes out of Yuma, you know, he's fair game. You know, if that avenger of blood is still upset about what happened, you know, he, he can go ahead and take him out. Because that was a punishment. That was with the punishment that was doled onto him. And now he's saying, look, well, I'm, I don't want to abide by these rules. I don't, you know, I'm not worthy of this punishment. I don't, you know, he's, he's trying to, you know, put off what's, what he's got coming to him, right? So it's not that this guy just gets off scot-free. You know, he still has to pay the consequences to some degree of what he's done. He goes on and says in verse 29, So these things shall be... For a statute of judgment un unto you throughout your generations and all your dwellings, whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death by mouth of witnesses. But one, uh, but one witness shall not satisfy any person to cause him to die. Moreover, he shall take no satisfaction for the life of a murderer. He is guilty, uh, he, uh, he, which is guilty of death. He shall surely be put to death. He's saying what? No satisfaction is he saying? It means you're not going to just pay it off. You're not, you're not going to accept anything other than death. That is the prescribed judgment. Nobody can say, oh, you know, life in prison. You know, 50 years and then probation. You know, they can't, he's saying no, that the only appropriate punishment for the murderer is death. You know, no, no therapy, no reintroduction to society, none of that. No satisfaction. Now, the only thing that's appropriate, God is saying, is that he would be put to death. Uh, verse uh, 33. So ye shall not pollute the land wherein ye are, for the blood uh, it defileth the land, and the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. You know, you want to talk, you want to talk, uh, you know, um, the destruction of the environment, Greta? You, know, <laughs> you want to talk about polluting the land? You know, environmentalist? That's what really defiles the land. You know, it's not, I mean, I understand there's pollution and things like that, but maybe people should worry a little bit less about some supposed hole in the ozone and start thinking a little bit more about the fact that this land is being polluted and defiled by the innocent blood that is being shed upon it. You know, and I don't want to go off on a tangent, but I'm kind of a little bit, you know, America has got a long, bloody past. It really does. When you start to study it, there's been a long trail of just innocent blood just being shed over and over again in this country. And it just seems like we're getting away with it. We're getting away with it. But God, you know, he, he's keeping track. And one day he's, gonna, uh, he's going to 
avenge all that innocent blood upon this land and even the whole world. <laughs> and he's saying, look, it's defiled. You say, well, can we, can we appeal God? Can we, can, we, can we appease Him? Can we, uh, can we make this right? Well, only if you, take, if you <laughs> shed the blood of Him that shed it. You know? And unfortunately, a lot of those people have passed off the scene. You know, there's a lot of people, a lot of people in, our, in the past of this country, the history of this country, that went on and shed a lot of innocent blood and they went on to live long, full lives and died natural deaths and went to the grave in peace. A lot of them. And they left a bloody wake in their path. And it's too late to avenge that blood. Those people are gone. So who's going to have to take care of that now? So now who's going to have to avenge the innocent blood? It's God. And that's what he's going to do. And quite frankly, if we stopped, you know, this is my opinion, but if you stopped abortions tomorrow, that just became illegal, and then we just did with every, you know, abortion doctor, as ought to be done with every murderer, because that's what he is, put him to death, you know, it still wouldn't be enough. It's too late for this country. You know, sorry to break it to you. I know this is not the most uplifting moment in, in, in our sermon here, but that's the facts. That's where we're at in this country. There's just this pool this ocean of blood that's been shed and God's going to have to cleanse it one day because it's too late these people have gone on he said in verse 34 defile not the land which ye shall inhabit wherein I dwell for I the Lord dwell among the children of Israel that's the real pollution that's going on in this country today it's not your, your it's not the the co2 emissions you know it's not the cows and their methane on some farm somewhere it's not the trash that's floating down some river. That's not what we should be concerned about. Those things, you know, the trash and things like that, yeah, we would like to see it cleaned up. You know, it makes the place look nice. But the real pollution that we have a problem with this in this country is all the innocent blood that's been shed. And it's too late. You know, there's no going back and cleaning that up. The people that, that did that are long gone. And, you know, the Lord here, what we're seeing is that he avenges innocent blood by shedding blood. That's what he's prescribed today. And that's what we would have to start doing if we wanted to start doing things by the Lord. Uh, doing things by God. Doing things right. Now again, I'm not saying that we as a church body are going to practice this. You as an individual are not to go out and start practicing this. We understand that. This is referring to the civil authorities. That's who God's talking to here. The judges, the Levites, the priests. He's saying, look, this is how you're going to pass judgment in this land. You know, these people are going to, it's not just this, you know, wild west where, you know, everyone's just hanging everybody else and, 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 and you know, uh, this vigilante justice. He's saying, look, you're going to bring these people, they're going to go to a city, they're going to bring the witnesses, they're going to make judgment, there's going to be a trial. You know, God is very careful, again, to do what? To prevent innocent blood from being shed. God, of course, wants to execute judgment and righteousness and balance the scales of justice. But he also understands that, you know, if we're not careful, we could execute the wrong people. That the wrong people could be put to death. It says there, now you can go back to Deuteronomy, and he says there in verse 11, but if any man hate his neighbor and lie in wait for him and rise up against him and smite him mortally that he die and fleeth into one of those cities, then the elders of that city shall send and fetch him thence and deliver him into the hand of the avenger of blood that he may die. So he's saying, look, if someone goes to one of these city, cities and it's, it, if he hates his neighbor, it finds, they find out, look, this guy, you know, he, he committed murder. He's saying, the judges of that city shall deliver him into the avenger of blood. He's saying, you're going to let him, you know, uh, take care of it. He's gonna, they're going to deliver him over uh, to the authorities that he may die. And he says in verse 13, Thine eye shall not pity him. Now, why does God have to say that? Why does God have to take the time, like he did in Deuteronomy 17, say that you shall not pity these people? Because people pity these people. And that's exactly where we are today. That's why these laws have been passed that you cannot execute murders. You cannot execute, a, you know, a child rapist cannot be put to death in this country. Pedophiles. That would do the most wicked things to the most innocent people among us. They're protected by a bunch of bleeding heart, you know, people who just want to just want to pity them and say, oh, those, you know, it was their past. Look, I'm, you know what? And a lot of times it's exactly right. It is the past. Something happens to these people in their childhood and they grow up and they do the same things that were done to them onto somebody else. They prey upon a, a victim like they were preyed upon. And that's unfortunate, but I'm not going to pity that person. 
You know, because if you, because think about it, you're just, if you allow that to continue, the cycle just keeps going. It just continues. You know, something happens to me when I'm a child, you know, I'm molested in some way. I want to get back at somebody for having that happen to me. So I go and do that to another child. That child grows up, has the same feelings I do. He goes and does it to another child. That child, you know what I mean? It just perpetuates itself. God's law puts a stop to it. And said, but it, what it requires of us is to not pity these people and say, oh, I'm sorry, you know, oh, but you don't understand. It was just what happened in the past. I understand it was what happened in his past, but that doesn't excuse him for what he did. And God wants this cycle to stop, to protect. It's not just, you know, it, it's not just, there's a purpose behind putting these people to death. It's to protect other people from them, you know, that the cycle would end. So that's what he's saying here. You, you know, you're going to deliver this guy over. And you will not pity him. You know, you're not going to just feel this, you know, oh, poor fella, you know. And, you know, people are real sorry when they get caught. People like to cry and when they get caught and, 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 and pull at your heartstrings and come up with all kinds of excuses. And if you're not careful, you know, they'll, they will cause you to pity them. You know, they'll tell you their sob story and everything that happened. And next thing you know, you're like, oh, poor guy. Well, that's too bad. Do we really have to? You know, no, God's saying, yeah, you have to. Look, you have to do this. No pity for this person. The, what they've done is wrong, <laughs> you know, uh, and you need to carry out justice. He says, thou shalt, uh, but if, uh, it goes on, thine eye shall not pity him, but thou shalt put away the guilt of innocent blood from Israel, that it may go well with thee. He's saying, look, if you want it to go well with Israel, you need to remove the guilt of innocent blood. If we want it to go well in our, in our country, you know, we need to put away the guilt of innocent blood. And uh, that's not something that's taking place anymore. And then he kind of shifts gears a little bit here in verse 14, and he says, Thou shalt not remove the na uh, thy neighbor's landmark, which they of old time have set in thine inheritance, which thou shalt inherit in the land that the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it. So this kind of, there's this principle, you know, we're talking about, here, you know, uh, civil justice, you know, criminal justice. And then we kind of get into property rights here as well. You know, God is kind of covering all the bases in, in, in society here. And he's saying, look, you know, there's also, you're not going to just move people's landmarks. And the Bible talks about this a lot. In fact, if you would, let's go over to Proverbs uh, chapter 23 real quick. Proverbs chapter 23. He repeats this again in Deuteronomy chapter 27 where he says, uh, Cursed be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say, Amen. So God's pretty serious about property rights. God's not a big fan of, you know, it doesn't sound like eminent domain was a thing with him. Um, you know, oh, we got to build a highway here, you know, and we got to plow down your house. You know, not in God's law. You know, that you don't get to just walk in and move somebody's landmark. You know, you should probably have to offer them a pretty hefty sum of money. And, you know, make things right, you know, and if they deny it, then, then, you know, your, your highway's got to go like that. But, um, you know, God here, he's, he's, he's protecting people's property and he doesn't want people, because here's the thing, you know, property, you know, people who, who, who amass a large amounts of land become very powerful, wealthy people. And that's another thing we see in God's law is that the, you know, the year of Jubilee, people were, you know, if, if somebody had sold their inheritance for money, you know, in the 50th year, the year of the Jubilee, that land was given back to them. You know, they were, they were allowed to go back into their inheritance. That way you didn't just went, uh, land, end up with these barons, you know, these just people who just amass huge quantities of land, then just sit on it. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I've no, I lived in a city where there was that, you know, mis everyone knew who, who the Olsons were, you know, Olson's Farms, because the guy had, he bought all the land around that city, and as it grew, you know, he would slowly sell it off to the city and he just got wealthier and wealthier and i'm not saying he was a bad guy you know he raised buffalo and he would you know slaughter the buffalo and donate it to the to the local barbecue and it was great we loved him for it but you know that what if he wasn't a great guy you know what if you know th and that thing's kind of gone on in the past people who just you know lord over people and make them you know their servants and their and their serfs you know and and just uh, use land to as a, a means of ruling over people but, you know, God is saying, look, you're not allowed to do that. You know, you, you can't just walk in and, and craftily steal somebody's land by moving a landmark. You know, and, and here's the thing. How do you do that? You do it real slow, right? 
maybe maybe they'd have you know t we actually have actual markers today if, in some properties you you'll you'll find them like these big poles and rods and things that are put in a certain uh, spot back then they probably used large stones or something you know but if i were to go out every night and just kind of push that land that marker over every week or so just push it over two feet you know on your back 40 and you know you're not there very often and then the next time you go there you're kind of scratching your head like man wasn't that 10 feet that way i don't know what you're talking about you know and then next month you come back and it's another few feet over you know and that's what he's saying you're not going to remove the ancient landmark you're not going to just come in and start kind of you know doing this to your neighbor and, and muscling them out and taking more land than than what's yours and I'm, I'm trying to not tell stories here tonight but it's, it's every time i read about this it just reminds me and I've, have i told you the lawn the, the the lawn mowing story when the guy moved in next door to me and the guy so we live next door to this guy or these people i grew up in this house we had this big lawn in the front yard uh the biggest one on the block you know it wasn't huge but we mowed it and then pat this lady who lived next door i mean i grew up next to this lady next door you know she actually had a shed that was like three feet on our property and then we didn't care and then we uh it was just there when we got the house and then we would mow about two or three feet onto her property it was just it was just the way we did it and uh, she sold the house, and this young couple moves in. And I remember I was living in the, at my mom's house at that time, and I go out to mow the lawn like I always do, and I mow right to where I always mow. And this, you know, and the, the grass had gotten, you know, pretty long. And the guy, the next day, the guy, he goes out and mows. And he mows, and I kid you not, he left a, a strip about that wide right down between our two yards. And I was like, well, welcome to the neighborhood, buddy. You know, what was he doing? He's pushing that ancient landmark, right? And he's saying, look, you, that's still your, you have to come. He must not have gotten the, the, the lay of the land when he bought the house. I felt like knocking on his door and be like, hey, you mind getting your shed off our property? If you want to be like that, you know, we, I can play that game, buddy. And then we kind of, I kind of had a standoff with him. You know, I'm like looking, I'm looking out my window in the morning, sitting in my coffee. I'm not mowing it. I'm going to wait for him to mow it, you know? And then I realized how childish what I just went out and mowed it, but... I don't know if that's got anything to do with it, what I'm talking about tonight, but it's kind of a funny story. I thought I'd share it, you know. We're talking about killing people in innocent blood, maybe a little levity here, but, uh, you know, what was the guy doing? He wasn't respecting the ancient landmark that we had established with Pat, you know. We said, hey, we'll mow on your property, and that was just the way we did things, and this new guy comes to town and just, you know, disregards it, and he's, you know, making a bad name for himself in my book. But, uh, you know, God's, you know, he doesn't want this type of thing going on. Where did I have you go? Proverbs chapter 23. He says in 22, he says, uh, Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Look at Proverbs chapter 23. And we're going to look at uh, verse 10. Remove not the old landmark and enter not into the fields of the fatherless. So you can kind of see what God's getting at here with this not removing the landmark. You know, he doesn't want people taking advantage of other weak people. Enter not into the field of the fatherless. You know, somebody whose, whose father has passed on, you know, before his time, you know, a widow and, you know, the young family, they might not understand where all these landmarks are. And now this other guy, you know, the neighbor sees it. Oh, here's my opportunity to walk in and to take advantage of these people. And say, oh, no, that's where that's always been. You know, it's always been this far over. No, it ha you know, it wasn't 30 feet back there. What do you mean? No, you didn't have these acre this acreage wasn't yours. It's always been here. Didn't your dad tell you that? Oh, he must not have told you. So that's what he's kind of getting at here. He's, he doesn't want people taking advantage of other people, you know, and, and, take, you know, and, and pushing that landmark. Now go ahead and go turn back to Deuteronomy uh, 19 where I had you. <coughs> so that seems like it's kind of just like a, a break you know, God just kind of put that in there. Sometimes he does that. And then, you know, and then when it kind of, then it kind of goes back to, you know, this deal of, of witnesses. You know, how are we going to handle people who are guilty of things? Maybe this guy, maybe there's somebody, you know, who committed murder. We got to get to the bottom of it. You know, did this guy kill this guy? Did he not kill this guy? Was it an accident? Was it murder? We don't know. Uh, did this guy go in and, 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 and enter into the field of the fatherless? Did he move the ancient landmark? Did he go in and remove his neighbor's landmark? Um, you know, is he cursed? You know, should we say that or not? Well, how are we going to find that out? Well, you're going to do that through witnesses. You know, again, because God is being careful here to preserve 
innocence of people and making sure they're not punished beyond what's due them, if at all. So look at verse 15. He says, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or any sin, and any sin that he sinneth. You know, and any sin, big, small, you know, one witness is not enough. It's not enough to just come saying, hey, I caught so-and-so doing this, that. Do you have another witness? No. Well, then why are you even talking to me about it? Why are we even bringing it up? You know, it's not good enough. You know, I mean, I, now it's your word against his. That's not good enough. You know, and this is something that we see in the, even in the New Testament. You know, against an elder thou shalt not receive an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin rebuke before all. Meaning, those that would not, that would come with an accusation against an elder without witnesses, those people are to rebuke before all that others also may fear. So he's saying, look, one witness is not, a, not enough. And any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses. Now, why is that nuance there? Why is it two or three? Well, if it's two and it's, it's things aren't just quite, you know, it sounds like this guy might be guilty, but we're still not quite sure, that's when you might need a third. You know, you might need somebody, a third witness to come in and, you know, kind of work out the details and say, oh, no, this is the piece of information you're missing. Everything clicks. You know, the guy's guilty or the guy's innocent. <coughs> uh, he says, out of the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall the matter be established. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him which is wrong, then both men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges which shall be in those days. Remember in verse chapter 17 we talked about if the controversy was too hard, they were to get up and go and see the Levites, right? This is what this is referring to here. And he says, which shall be in those days and the judges shall make diligent, diligent inquisition and behold, if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother. So this hard thing comes up. They're un they can't make a judgment. They can't get to the bottom of it. They're basically what we would, you know, they would appeal to a higher law in the land. You know, this is kind of like our version of the Supreme Court, kind of. You know, this is them taking it to somebody else. That who's going to spend more time making more diligent inquiry, really digging in there and getting to the bottom of this and, and, and doing it with, uh, you know, the leading of the Lord and, and, his, and his spirit as well. <coughs> and he says there, uh, then, then shall you do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. Now this is a great law. This is a fantastic law. This would deter a lot of people from making false accusations. You say, does that ever happen? Yes, it does. Does sometime, does she cry rape when it never happened? Yes, that happens. Do people call other people on other people's children and say, oh, they're abusing their kids when they're not? Yes, that happens. And according to God's law, what they sought to have done unto that person would be done unto them. You say, what's the purpose of that? To deter that from even happening. You know, if I was going to rise up and say, you know, Brother Fabian killed somebody, you know, and I'm a false witness, and I'm trying to get him in trouble for murder, and it's found out I'm lying, then I'm, you know, <laughs> that's it for me. You know, that fact alone would probably keep me from doing that. Yeah. Other than the fact that, you know, I love Fabian, I'd never do that to you, brother, but you know what I mean? It's a deterrent. It keeps people from doing that kind of thing. You know, people wouldn't call CPS if they knew it was their kids that might end up getting taken away. You know, she wouldn't cry rape, you know, if, if she knew it was her that might be end up swinging from a tree or whatever it is. And uh, he says here in verse 19, Then shall you do unto him as he sought to have done unto his brother, so, so shall thou put evil away from among you. It's an evil type of person that brings up a false accusation and, and an attempt to get somebody else put to death, beaten, fined, whatever, in, in order to have some kind of punishment rolled on. It's an evil heart that does that. And those which remain shall hear and fear and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. God's law is a deterrent. People say, this is harsh. No pity. Uh, do unto them as they sought to have them do unto others. Hey, they got to the bottom and they found out his liar. Why not just let them both go? They found out it was a false accusation. Why not just let them both go? Because they'll do it again. And they'll say, oh, there's no consequences for just bringing up false accusations? Well, maybe I'll try. Maybe I'll may, let me take a stab at it and see if I can get somebody killed or whatever. You know, he says, look, if you follow my law, if you do things the way God has laid them out to be done in his word, 
if a, if a nation would execute God's law the way he has told them to do it, he says right there, you shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. It would deter so many people from doing bad things. They would, they would just, you know what, they'd say, whoa, what am I even thinking trying to do this? this me trying to get somebody else in trouble? Why, why am I even thinking about this, bringing up a false accusation? What's wrong with me? Let me just focus on my own life. Let me get my heart right. And let me just do good unto others. You know, it would, it would probably fix a lot of evil with people. <clears throat> and he says in verse 21, he repeats himself, and thine eyes shall not pity. You know, you're not going to feel sorry for these people. You know, you're not going to give them an excuse. You're not going to give them a pass because of their sob story. If what they did, if they did what they did, you're going to execute judgment mercilessly. That's how God is. I mean, we, we, we look at hell and we say, you know, Lord have mercy. You know, I mean, we pity those poor people. And certainly God does far more than us. You know, there is, uh, I'm not saying God is not without compassion and love. And, you know, he sent his own son to die for them. But there is a side to God that says they deserve to be there. They deserve it. And, he's, and, and God, they are tormented in the presence of the Lord and of his angels day and night. That's the righteous, holy side of God. God can be pitiless. And God, but we understand also God is long-suffering and very merciful. But there's, it's both, folks. You know, there's a time for mercy and there's a time for judgment. And God's saying, look, when they're guilty, you know, and, and it's found out, and the thing be true, no pity. And I shall not pity them, but life shall go for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. What's God trying to do? He's trying to balance the scales. So, you know, we should be careful not to just, you know, write God's law off as harsh. You know, God's law on the surface to our human understanding, especially those that have been brought up in a culture that is contrary to much of this, it might rub us the wrong way. But, you know, as I've heard said, and I like to say from time to time, if it's rubbing the cat the wrong way, the cat needs to turn around and get right. And, and that's, that's what we need to do as a society. You know, if we wanted to try and spare ourselves, uh, you know, some of the wrath that's coming our way, we would say, look, God's law is right. Let's, let's abide by it and see if we can't get some things right. God's law is just, holy, and perfect, you know, and, and, and we ought to abide by it. We would we'd be better off for it as, as a society and as individuals. Let's pray.